Hello my gorgeous, beautiful, wonderful queen bees. It is your girl Amanda the Buzz Artist. Welcome back to my channel. And ladies and gents, we got another fall month tutorial up in here, up in here. We are going to be painting this really cool spook, spooking, looking, looking. Oh my God, English. We are going to be painting this super cool, spooky, haunted house scene beset with trees, creepy looking grass, and best of all, pumpkins. So be sure to grab your brushes and grab your supplies and come meet me. I'm gonna show you exactly how to do the shiznaz. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let us begin. I'm gonna choose to start this painting with an 11 by 14 acrylic pad paper. This is from Arteza. And I'm a very big fan of this particular type of acrylic pad because it just saves a lot of space and doesn't take up as much, as much room as canvas. But if you decide to go with canvas, just go with some pre-gessoed canvas, no problem. And we're gonna do this in the portrait orientation. And because I'm dealing with canvas paper, I'm just gonna go ahead and tape this down to the surface really quick. Then I'm gonna grab my palette paper, or you can just use regular plastic palettes, up to you. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and add in our colors. And lucky for us, we're only just using two types of acrylic paint, which is gonna be a scarlet red, a mid yellow, Mars black, and some titanium white. As for our brushes, we're gonna go with a half inch flat wash brush, a number 10 flat shader brush, as well as a, a detail round brush. This one is a two over zero, but you can always use a number zero detail round brush as well to do all your nice tiny details. Then you're also going to need a cup of water as well as a towel. So all of the supplies that I use for this painting, you can find that in the description below. So with that being said, Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. So to start with all of our paintings, I always recommend to start with the background. The background is always a central point. It's always where you want to start. I'm just going to grab my half inch flat wash brush. I'm going to activate it by dipping it in water and put a quick dab on my towel. And then what we're going to do is we're going to start with the black sky, okay? And so when we call this the underpainting. This is going to be the part where you're just laying down colors to establish uh, what's going on in the painting. So I'm just gonna take my brush and I'm just gonna take from the edge of the pools of paint that I have here and lightly coat my brush, okay? I don't want a lot of paint on my brush, mind you, okay? I'm gonna dip it in water once again just to kind of get a little bit more lubricated. With that being said, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna start towards the top of the painting here. And again, I'm not too concerned about this being perfect just yet because we're just, we're making an underpainting. We're just establishing colors where color blocks are gonna go more or less, okay? Now, if you don't happen to have a half inch flat wash brush, you know, honestly, um, any flat wash will do, really. It's just to help you cover a lot more ground in a shorter amount of time so you're not here forever trying to, trying to, you know, cover one particular area of paint of, or of your area, right? So, honestly, if you have something else that works that can cover a lot of area for you, go ahead and use that. Okay. So I don't want to do too much of the black here, but I just want to establish a band of black. And you can choose to cover your entire canvas with this, or leave, you know, whatever areas around it white, and then you can always cut it later. It's up to you. I'm gonna leave bits of the areas untouched, but you don't have to do that. And then I'm thinking maybe we can do another one on the side here. Just like so. Again, don't be too concerned about making this perfect. It's not supposed to be perfect. All right. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. And so I'm gonna get my brush a rinse. Because next what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and add another band of color to just represent uh, another, another set of colors that are happening here. So I'm going to make the color orange. To do that, you're going to take that yellow and then 
you're gonna take some red, okay? I always start equal parts red and yellow first, and then I kind of adjust. If I think it looks a little too red, I add a bit more yellow. If it looks a little too yellow, I add a bit more red. But I kind of like that color, actually. And again, you don't want to load your brush too much, okay? You're, you got a nice even coating on both sides of your brush here. That's what you want. And then we're just going to go ahead and add in that orange, basically wherever you see white, and into the black. So we're trying to represent like the landscape here with our underpainting. We're trying to figure out, okay, where does the sky end? Where does the land begin? And what's cool about this painting, there is a lot of blending that happens, which really creates this nice like fall look to the whole painting. So I thought that was really cool when I was actually coming up with this painting, all the colors and how they kind of go with each other and how they blend. So um, here, I'm actually taking some of that orange and bringing it up into the black. And like I said before, this is just our underpainting. So don't be too, too concerned about making this part perfect just yet. We're getting there. And I'm primarily doing horizontal strokes with my brush. Again, not concerned about being too perfect. We're just laying down swaths of color. Okay. All right. So I've pretty much done what I had to do with just laying down my swaths of color. Now I want to go back to this intersection here, the part where the black meets with the orange. You can see that it has that gradient that kind of forms. It's a little weak right now, considering that I already laid the first layer down and it's actually almost dry, which is ideal. But I'm just going to go back in and lay another layer of that orange on top. So this, this is at the point now where we're starting to build our layers and starting to add a bit more of the intent behind what we're trying to do here. So if you're not familiar with how acrylic paint works, it basically uh, is a very water soluble pigment that's in, the, in, the, in, that's in a certain like polymer emulsion. So basically what this means is when you're working with it when it's in the wet state, like aka out of the tube and with water, it's water soluble, it can be spread around, but when it dries, it dries into a plastic um, that cannot be reactivated, you know, in a typical sense with acrylic paint. So that means once you lay a layer down and it completely dries, you can add more layers on top and um, the layer underneath will not be affected by the water. So it's basically like you're dealing with another, just another layer. Um, it's not like watercolors where the previous paint that you laid down underneath activates and can be blended um, and reworked. And it's not like oil where it takes so long to dry in between layers. Acrylic paint has that very unique quality to it, which is why I like it a lot. And it's why I recommend it for a lot of people who are just starting painting because, well, you're not waiting a super long time to paint and you get an immediate win. Okay, so I'm just, I'm just making multiple layers at this point. I'm grabbing a baby a little bit more yellow at times and just kind of working that blend a little bit. I want it to have that, I want it to be like a really, really nice blend. That's really cool. Okay, awesome. Maybe I'll just carry it up just a little higher, water it down a little bit more with my water. Water it down with water. Good one, Amanda. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna grab 
that black once again. Not too much this time, because I just I just want to I just want to work that blend a little bit. Now, if ever you've seen my blending video, I do talk about you know what works best when you are in your blending mode. So if you haven't seen that video yet, please check it out. It's really good for anybody who's just getting started with acrylic painting and you know is trying to master what a good blend looks like. But more or less, you want to make sure your paint is nice and wet so you can work and do blending in general. Because when you don't have a blend uh, with, a, with wet paint, it's going to be very, very hard for you. And like we said, acrylic paint, when it's dry, it's unblendable. It cannot be used anymore. Okay. Now I'm just going to go ahead and add another layer of black to the corners here. Goodness, I just love dipping it in water. It creates like an ink. Oh, so pretty. I'm just trying to be a little bit more precise now with my lines. Okay. Beautiful. So I'm really liking how the background here is coming together. And uh, I think we're ready to move on to the next step, which is going to be adding in our moon. So, man, that bird outside is really loud. Um, so I'm just going to wait for this part to dry, maybe take another minute or so, and then we'll go in and start to add in our moon. But in the meanwhile, while that's drying, we can actually start making the landscape down here. So again, just with our uh, one, hit, one half inch brush, I'm going to grab that black. And uh, I'm just going to make a line because this is just going to represent like a valley like a hill that will be, that opens up into the scene before us. So I kind of have a line that's like very gradually sloping to the right. And then we can even even out this line right here. Make another line kind of like going like this. So it's, it's less of a, you know, a big, um, like steep drop off. It's very smooth. I think I think that looks really cool. So you can experiment a little if you want to level out the bottom. You can go ahead and do that. So that one's pretty simple. Okay, awesome. So now we're ready to move on with our moon. Now, some of you may not be super comfortable doing a moon with a one half inch flat wash brush. And if that's the case, you can always move on to a filbert brush. Let me just go grab him. You can always move on to using a filbert brush. It's basically a brush that has a rounded tip to it. They're really good for making circles and circular shapes. So if you are uncomfortable working with you know, a, a flat wash brush, you can always use a filbert. But I'm gonna show you how to do this with a flat wash brush because it's I find it's fairly easy to kind of master. Okay, so to start our moon here is gonna have a bit more of like a pale, pale, pale yellow to it. So we're just gonna go ahead and make a pale yellow. So we're gonna grab some white. And then I'm gonna grab some yellow, not that much. I would say two parts um, white to one part yellow. And I'm just gonna keep adding white to it because I think this is a little too yellow. Yeah, it's good. Again, you don't want a lot of paint on your brush, so squeegee it off if you can. Okay. So I got a nice finely loaded brush, not too much paint on it. Now we're gonna go towards the center of the painting here to add in our moon. And I'm thinking I wanna add it like, I would say like right around here. So maybe from the top of your painting, give it about an inch, an inch and a half down towards the center. And that's where we're gonna establish our moon. And it's gonna be, I'd say at most three, three and a half inches tall or in diameter. So all we're gonna do, um, what I usually like to do is I start with the tip and then I just start making a circle. Just like so.
So I'm just moving my brush, making sure that the tip is always facing the outside of the circle that we're making. Okay. Now, of course, you can always make the moon bigger, which I'm planning on doing right now. So you can just keep turning your brush, keep turning, keep turning, keep turning. All right. Turn, 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 turn. And then you can just fill it in. Okay. Pretty good moon. It could be bigger though. I prefer big moons. So just add more bones to it. <laughs> So, and if you want to see the filbert in action, I'm just gonna dip it in water, activate, grab that, grab that yellow, that moon yellow we made. Make sure it's not just soaking through your brush. And then you just use the tip and let it do the dirty work for you. Just like that. So you get nice precision and control. Just like so. And maybe I'm just gonna bring it a little more down. So you can keep experimenting with the size of this moon. You know, if you're if you really like big moons, just keep uh, just keep adding slowly, slowly, slowly as you're doing this. All right. And then I think I found my ideal moon size. So basically, we can go in with another layer. Um, I usually switch back to a flat wash brush to help me with multiple layers. So I'm just gonna wait for this layer to dry just a tad before I go and reapply that second layer, just so I get less brush strokes that you are seeing. Which It's almost dry, actually. So let me just prep that color up. So I gotta say, I've been having so much fun. I always have fun on Halloween. Like I, it's one of my favorite holidays, um, mainly because it's just, there's no expectations in terms of like family obligations or gift giving. Of course you have, you know, there's candy, the candy giving. Um, but that part's just, I find that's just philanthropic. I think it's fun. Um, I don't know. It doesn't have that same like, like marketing flair as I find Christmas does because Christmas is such a big money maker. Um, especially for, for those of you living in America, you all know what I'm talking about. It's like, you know, you're already starting to see Christmas, <laughs> uh, advertisings all over the place and it, it just gets on my nerves. But even, I mean, even Halloween, it's kind of bad too with the advertising, but I don't know. When it comes to Halloween, it's just there's no there's very, there's a lot less required of you. You're not required to like go to other people's houses to celebrate. Um, you're not required to get a gift. <laughs> you know, just get a bunch of candy, get sugar. You know, um, and everyone kind of dresses up, and you know, you just become like a little kid again with your costumes and your decorations if you choose to do so. I read an article recently and I was like kind of taken aback. There are some places that are finding uh, children over the age of 13, so people, uh, teenagers over the age of 13, for going out trick-or-treating. So if you are over the age of 13 and you are out trick-or-treating in a costume, you will be fined because 
God knows what. <laughs> I guess, you know, there's public safety that was told that was the reason for it. But I just found that was really sad. It's like, well, I would rather have, you know, teenagers come trick-or-treating and just participate in the in the swing and, and mood of Halloween than, you know, doing other God knows what, like drugs or or, you know, whatever. Like, I find... To just say trigger treating is just meant for little kids, I think it's just that's not right. You know, I love trick or treating, and I don't want and I and I would hate to get a one hundred dollar fine because um, I decided to go trick or treating by myself with a costume, not bothering anybody, just saying trick or treat. I'd love to get some candy, <laughs> trick or treat, smell my feet, you know, that whole thing, and. You know, you get a, a police, like, ticket for that. You know, I find that's ridiculous. Just let, can we just let kids be kids? Can we just let, you know, us be children and not be punished for it? I don't think that was right. Um, <laughs> anyways, rant over. <laughs> I know I just went, like, on a rant there for a second, but... Anyways, so our moon here is pretty much finished. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna wait for this puppy to dry a little bit. And we're gonna move on to the next step. I think that this is like a combination of like background foliage and like weird, like cool looking clouds. So um, we're gonna grab our shader brush actually for this part. And what we're gonna start doing first is we're gonna grab some orange. So we're just gonna take equal parts red and yellow. I'm gonna add a bit more yellow this time to really get a, a nice orange color. Okay. And then once I have that, again, I don't want too much on my brush. What we're gonna do, we're gonna locate the, um, hor the horizon line here. So I'm gonna say the horizon line's like right about here. Okay. So I'm just gonna draw a line across just to help me remember that. Just like so. You want to make it just visible enough so you know where to go, where to place this next part here. Okay? Okay. So once you got that down, what we're going to do now is we're going to do a dabbing technique. Kind of like this. I'm taking my brush and I'm dabbing it. And I'm just trying to make like little furry piles of, uh, it looks, it just looks really furry. Um, I'm guessing it's kind of like a combo of like cloud bush things. So we're just gonna represent that with a dabbing of this paint color right over into the black background. So it just kind of looks like that. Okay, there's not like a complete total form to it but it's getting there. So we're gonna do one there. Maybe, let's do some on top here. Of course, this is gonna require several layers from us. But that's okay, we're laying down the underpainting first. And then we can go back in later. So this is what we got so far. to make it nice and uh, fluffy looking. Okay, cool. And then there's gonna be some on this side, on the left. So I'm gonna go up a little higher here, add that in. Again, just dabbing. Just adding in that color, no big deal. Okay. No big deal. So, have you figured out a Halloween costume for yourselves yet? I am still kind of on the fence, although um, I've gotten some really great ideas 
from um, some of my friends because we're you know we're we're at that point now we're pregnant we're kind of we're getting really big um, so Halloween costumes are always going to be like interesting for us pregnant ladies so getting creative with it is certainly certainly been fun <laughs> I I enjoy it a lot actually okay we're just gonna do some other cube here okay um, and I'm gonna stop I don't want to do too much especially like underneath the moon I don't want to lose too much of that clearance so I'm just gonna stop around that area Okay, and then, of course, by the time I'm at this area, this part here is almost practically dried. So we can go in again with another layer of that orange and go at it again. Okay, someone complained to me once that, oh my gosh, you use so many layers. Well, that is acrylic painting. <laughs> acrylic painting is all about just adding layer upon layer upon layer and building. Okay, there is this there is this belief out there that like the first brush stroke you make has to be the final one. Nah, that is the furthest thing from the truth ever. There are many layers that can go into a painting. Okay, and a lot of people complain. It's like, well, I run out of paint. Well, you're also <laughs> using a lot as you are starting. So I always recommend you squeegee off paint as you're using it. Don't take too much. Start with very little and then you keep adding more as you go. That has been one of my biggest secrets <laughs> to acrylic painting, honestly, is just kind of starting small and then work your way to adding more when you need it. You don't want to be adding globs and globs and then you're kind of like forcing yourself. It's almost like um, the, the whole like popcorn psychological trick, like the bigger the bucket, the more you will eat. Um, the more paint globs you have, the more you're going to use subconsciously. So my thought process is give yourself a little bit at a time that forces you to work in smaller batches and thereby forcing you to not use as much paint all at once. That has been a trick of the trade. You're welcome. <laughs> that has helped me out immensely. So you can already see with our second layer here, the colors are really starting to pop more. I'm actually pretty happy with this. It's looking good. So once you have that down, we're gonna go ahead and add an accent color to these uh, cloud like leaf things. So I'm gonna give my brush a good rinse. And then what we're gonna do, we're just gonna grab some straight up yellow. I don't want too much of my brush, just, just a nice coating. And then we're just going to uh, add a dab motion to the edges of what we just laid down with our orange. Now I'm not just doing it in one in just one row and not um, and just like doing it in one row and leaving it alone. I'm kind of dabbing, but I also take a little bit into the center, just a little bit. And because I don't have that much paint on my brush, this subtle effect shows up, which is so nice. So I'm just gonna take advantage of that. I'm primarily populating all the edges with this yellow, but I am trying to take it out into the center just a bit more. Just so I diffuse that clump of yellow that shows up. So I'm kind of bringing it down a little bit, not too much. Yeah, look how cool that looks. Already you got that nice contrast. You got that nice complimentary contrast. 
which sounds also counterintuitive at the same time, but I'm just dabbing. Again, I don't have a lot of paint on my brush, people. I need you to heed my words. Do not put a crap ton of paint on your brush. You're not doing yourselves any favors whatsoever. <laughs> and the um, I'm concentrating some of the yellow in certain areas. Like, I'm not putting any yellow on the top here because I'm trying to also capture what this would look like with the reflection of the moon itself. So that's kind of what I'm trying to get across here. So this is going to have some of the top peaks reflected in the moonlight. Here as well. And this doesn't have to take long, to be honest with you. You know, a nice, a nice simple dabbing technique will just do you fine. Like, how cool does that look? It automatically, it just, again, it gives you this nice Halloween vibe, right? So much fun. Okay, I'm just going to add a little bit towards the center here with the yellow. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Have fun with this. You know what I mean? It's acrylic paint. You know, you're not filing taxes. Your life is not going to come to an end if you make a mistake. Honestly, it's paint. <laughs> you know, it's funny. When I was doing paint night, that was one of the biggest things I had to tell a lot of people who would come and uh, do my sessions with me. They are just very concerned. They want to make it the most perfect painting they've ever seen. And also, it's the first time. They've never done any paintings before, but it's got to be perfect. <laughs> and then there's a part of me that kind of giggles. It's like, oh, okay. All right. So let me tell you something about what art is. <laughs> art is not an end result thing that we're all conditioned to think. Yeah, it's nice to get, you know, especially when you're learning, we're all conditioned to think like, my end result needs to be absolutely perfect. And that's that's one of our biggest mistakes as artists is we want the end result to be perfect that we kind of forget the whole process of learning what it is that it takes to, you know, get from one brush stroke to the next. And because we forget that, we just get frustrated in the process. And then we we say, you know what, I'm not good at this because my end result looks like poop. I'm not good at what I uh, being an artist. And I'll tell you what. You give a, a six a four year old. You give a four year old a paintbrush. They're not gonna. Sh they're not gonna tell you, I'm not good at this. Um, when they show you a painting that has full of lines on it, they're proud of their work, and they explain to you what the painting means. And it's all about the process for them. It's all about like, well, I made this line to make this. This is what this is. It's not end result for them. It's more the process of getting to tell that story. And we lose that when we become adults, when we become more self-critical and start comparing our work to others. And that's something we, <laughs> we and I suffer from it too. Sometimes queen bees, it happens. That's something we need, we as adults battle every single day is that comparison, am I good enough? And my answer to you, and it's obvious, you are good enough, you, you are fine. We just put so much emphasis on perfection that we forget oftentimes that just learning is the adventure, is the painting experience we are looking for, okay? All right, so I, I, as you can see, I'm kind of going back and forth with the yellow and the orange, just working on my blends. Again, you know, I'm working with my layers, I'm playing around. I, you know, I'm not too concerned about messing up because I can always go back in and add additional colors as I see fit. So I'm just going to do one final run through with yellow. You can see the colors start to really pop more and more, which is awesome. Okay. 
yeah, we've got a really cool looking, cool looking set of uh, leaf cloud thingies. <laughs> hey, awesome. Okay, so now that we've gotten that, we're just gonna wait for this part to dry. While that's drying, let's work on our on our horizon a little bit. So we kind of set a separation line before we started putting in our, our trees and stuff. But we're gonna go ahead and define that a little bit more. So um, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna retire our shader brush. We're gonna go back to our half inch flat wash brush. Okay, and this time I'm going to experiment with a different tonal value for this orange, meaning I wanna go a little lighter. So I'm gonna make that orange once again, and I'm gonna grab a lot of white. By a lot, like a dab of white. <laughs> so you get this like lighter orange color than what you've been previously working with. And then with the flat wash brush using the tip, I'm just going to define an edge. So I'm not going to the very edge of the horizon line, but I'm getting close to there because I just want to start defining like light and darker areas here and there. So I'm not covering the entirety of the, um, of the orange that we set beforehand with the ground but just enough. I'm using the tip of my brush only here just to help me get those nice crisper lines at the, at the intersection points here. And then as it gets towards the middle is when I go with my broadside and am more liberal with my strokes. So you can already start seeing the different values of color. This one's darker, obviously, than what we just previously laid down. Over here is, you know, much darker as well but it does create the sense of depth, doesn't it? Okay. So we're just going to, we're just gonna go ahead and add that, that tonal value in here. And I'm also, you know, concentrating it where we made our bushes, right? Again, I just want to establish a sense of a boundary line. Okay. I don't want to add too much as we get towards the um, for the forefront, aka like the closer we are to the painting, which we can assume is like right around here. This is further from us. This is closer to us. Okay, that's actually looking really cool. Now, I'm pretty satisfied with that first layer, but we can go ahead and add a bit more tonal value. So I'm going to grab my orange once again. This time, no, no added white to it. And with the tip, I'm just gonna do some layering. I'm not, again, it's kind of like how I did with the um, lighter version of orange. I'm just kind of going in sections to various areas, just so I can add pops of color. And it's really working out for us. And again, this, this is where the joy of acrylic painting comes into play here. You know, if you feel that, oh my gosh, I really, you know, I lost, I lost a lot of tonal values, something that just doesn't look right, wait for it to dry or just go in with an another, like a darker version of the paint or lighter version and layer, okay? It may not look quite right right away, and that's normal. Okay, <laughs> I don't want you to think that because it doesn't look a certain way, you know, because it looks a certain way, it, it's never going to be salvageable. It, it's paint. Okay, acrylic paint is so forgiving. You can do a lot with that. Okay, so again, now as I'm making orange, I add a maybe a little bit more red to it for certain areas. And... Usually what I end up doing, I like to concentrate um, some of that in patches here and there. Just like so. Now, maybe I want to add more of like a hilly, like a little hill that's showing up right here. And we can do that with, um, with a nice orange. So uh, we're going to make that orange. 
Um, but this time I'm going to put a little bit more red in it just so it's maybe more of a, like a reddish orange. And uh, maybe I'll put it like, I'll start the line right here. So maybe like an inch from the horizon line. And then I'm just going to make a sloping line going downwards towards the right of the painting. I use the tip of my brush to set the line and then I use the broad side to help me break up that line so it's not like it's so definitive. So I kind of sweep it back and forth. Again, I didn't use a lot of paint. That's very important to note. Do not use a lot of paint. You're not trying to do an impasto painting. You're not trying to go crazy right now. You're just trying to lay down colors and blends and those are kind of delicate. So if you have a lot of paint on your brush, it's gonna be hard to control, okay? So I'm gonna do another little hill with that same reddish orange right around here somewhere. Okay, and then I'm just gonna add a little bit of white to that orange we were working with. So it's a little, oops, so it's a little lighter. Okay, again, squeegee off the excess. And then um, with the broad side, very, very lightly. Just gonna add some of that to break up the bands that we just made. I don't want it to be too in your face, honestly. So you can already feel that there's like texture, there's landscape, there's undulations in the in the actual landscape itself, which is totally fun. Okay. Oh, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> this looks really cool. Awesome. Okay. So now Let's just take a look. Yeah, we are pretty much dried and ready to go to move on to our next step, which is adding in our haunted house. I will include a traceable for you guys so that you can refer to that to make it. But it's fairly straightforward and pretty um, geometrical. So there's nothing really too tricky about it. It's just a matter of getting your details right. So I'm going to grab my detail round brush, dip it in water. And then we're going to do this in black because this is going to be a silhouette house. Now I'm grabbing my paint again and I repeat myself, do not overload your brush. You want it nicely loaded, but you don't want it, you don't want too much on it. Okay, so let's go ahead and add in our haunted house, shall we? Now um, I'm thinking I want it to be offset from the moon. Like, so I want like the center of the house primarily to be like right around here. So what we're gonna start with is, I'm gonna start with the tip of the house first. You can use the traceable here to place it where you see fit, but I'm just gonna freehand this part. So I'm gonna make a triangle shape to represent the roof. Again, I'm constantly dipping back into my water. Keep it nice and lubricated. All right, so triangle, cool. Next step. There's a little chimney. So that's done with a straight line, just like so. Then we do a, a square, almost like a rectangle because it's be a little bit longer than a, than a rectangle underneath. And then we got the second roof. The second roof, which is bigger in size, obviously. So it's going to go span out on both sides. And then it's going to come down and curve outwards. Kind of like that. Same thing on this side, curves outward. Okay, and then they connect. Okay. 
And then I'm gonna fill it in later actually. So next we're gonna do the walls which come inward. So it's not, it's not flush with the outside tip here. It's, it goes in. And then uh, same with this guy, it's gonna come in just like that. And then we have another line coming out, goes past that roof. And then it's gonna slope downwards. Kind of like that. Slopes out just like so. And it comes back in. Then line comes down just like so. Okay? So that's almost, that's pretty much like almost your entire haunted house. You just did one half of it. So now let's go back to this side. And this time we're gonna bring the bring this wall down just a little bit more. And then we're gonna make the roof. So it comes out like so. Spires out. Just like that. Comes in. And then comes down. Et voila. Okay. So far, so good. <laughs> All right. So once you have that, we're just going to establish our windows. So there are two windows in this little area here. So we're going to do two rectangle boxes. Just like that. And then there's another four down here. So you got window one, window two, window three, and then a little bit of space and then we got another window right over here. And then we got a little like porch that shows up right here. So that's gonna come out with a line. So for the roof. So you make that shape. Your line coming down just underneath. And then another line halfway up. And that's gonna represent like the railings. Just like so. Okay. I'm just gonna connect those. I like that. Okay, so you pretty much have almost your entire haunted house here. So um, I'm just gonna make the railings, which are just gonna be straight lines that are connecting. And then I'm gonna do the uh, window panes themselves. So basically we do the window panes with a straight line coming down and then one, two, three lines going across. Try to make them equal, as equally spaced as you can. One, two, one, two, three. And then I got another one here. One, two, three. Another one here. One, two, three. One here. One, two, three. Another one here. One, two, three. There we go. And uh, from then on out, you can go ahead and fill in your house. You can either use your detail brush to do that, or you can move on to like a slightly uh, larger brush so you're not here all day to fill that in. But I'm actually feeling pretty comfortable with the detail brush, so. I'm just going to fill it in with that. I find I always like hold my breath for these tiny details. I'm like, don't breathe, don't move. <laughs> just let the brush do the work.
It's so cool to see too, when you start filling this in, just how much it comes to life. Like it really does look like this house that's just encased in shadow and moonlight, you know, against a hill. It's so spooky. I love it. I live for it, darling. So we're just gonna fill in that roof. Paint around the windows. This part's always the most therapeutic for me because it's just full of detail, but it really does like start putting together your entire scene for you, which is always awesome. And you know what's really cool too? Because you already did your background, you can already see the background like peeking through the windows, which I think is a really great effect. Okay, so the bottom of the house, I'm just, I just want to represent how it's like kind of undulating with the hill that it's on. So I'm just going to try to find the shape of the hill, which it's kind of got this like, this like, uh, this kind of shape going on with it. Like that. So I just established that. Just like so. All right, cool, cool beans. All right, so maybe I'll just, and again, you can just tweak the roofing, you can make it slopier, you can make it taller. You know, this is completely up to you how you wanna twist and turn it. Get creative with it. Beautiful. And uh, so now that we have that, let's let's make little fence posts that are that are along the house here. So. We got a set that are coming out this way. So let's start with just some more, uh, some vertical lines. So I'm just gonna do one right here, do another one right here, maybe another one right here, and then another one that's slightly further downwards, okay? And then we do two lines that are connecting back to the house. So two horizontal lines, just like so. And then these two here, because it's going to represent like a, a turning of the fence. You just kind of vary those lines a little. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> this is looking really cool, actually. Now that we have that, let's move on to adding in our trees. So this is the part where a lot of people get a little squeamish because it's trees and everyone gets nervous when it comes to making trees. Let me tell you something. When it comes to trees, it's just lines. That's all they are. There is nothing to be afraid of. So to start with our trees, we're gonna move over to our number 10 shader brush. And uh, we want it because it has that nice uh, edge that we're looking for. That's gonna help you a lot when it comes to making your trees. So we're going to dip it in some water, then we're going to go in with the black. Once again, <laughs> I hope you're saying this with me, do not overload your brush. Don't put that much on your brush, okay? We don't want a glob of paint on your brush. Okay, check. So we're going to go and start with our first tree. Now when it comes to making a tree, a tree is really just a wonky looking line. That's all there is to a tree. So uh, let's start with a tree that's in the background here. And uh, we're gonna make our line, I'm gonna start with the tip of the brush, give myself about uh, like an inch and a half of clearance or so. I'm just gonna just make a line of where to start with my tree. So I'm gonna do a line coming up. And uh, you'll see that my line is not straight. That's okay. 
All right, and then we're gonna do, go back down to the bottom here. And then we're gonna do another line. Come up like this. And I'm kind of releasing pressure from the brush as I go upwards, okay? That's all there is to it. Then we're gonna fill it in. Give it a little bit more meat. And then of course, I like to extend it because usually when you add more meat to the branches themselves, you gotta compensate with the uh, branch. So to the trunk itself, you just need to compensate with making the branches a little higher and thicker. So it looks a little bit more like a tree does. When it comes to trees, um, usually it's always the, the, the trunk that's the widest. And then as it branches off is when it thins out. And that's always, that's pretty much always like the case with trees. And then when it comes to the trunk and the roots, I just kind of taper them out like so. And I don't sweat the details of that too, too much. Just a little bit like that. Okay. And that ladies and gents is how you do a tree. Let's do another one. So let's go to that little hill that we made right around here. We're gonna stagger it a little to the right for our, our second tree. So again, using the tip of my brush, we're going up, 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 up. So this one's a little bit more straighter than we did with the initial tree that we made. And I'm gonna make a taper to represent the roots. And then um, I'm gonna go like right around here, where we initially actually moved a little higher, right around here, where we made our first line for this tree. And then I'm gonna make it come out, come out and up, just like that, okay? So that's gonna represent the second branch of this tree. And then I'm just gonna add meat. Again, as the branches taper out, they thin. And then as it goes towards the trunk, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. All right, awesome. And that's really all there is to it with trees. Honestly, it's, um, you're just trying to you're just trying to create um, like thinner looking lines as they branch out. And of course, if you're not comfortable using a um, shader brush, you can always use your detail brush to do the branches. So with a detail brush, you can always just go to the part where it tapers out and just very lightly, uh, you know, with, with light pressure, add in a branch or two. And I always say branches kind of make a Y shape. Every branch that I've ever worked with, they kind of resemble like a Y. So if you notice this branch here, it makes like a Y shape, like that. Same with this branch and so on and so forth. Okay, so we did two trees. Let's go ahead and make another one. We got two more I think we're gonna put right around here actually. So I'm gonna go back to my shader brush, load it, and then uh, we're gonna put the first tree, we'll do it right here. And this time I wanna make the trees kind of leaning a little bit. So with the tip, I'm just gonna make the first line. It's kind of dipping out, coming out like that. So you're kind of making like a line that curves outwards like that. Then from that center part here, we'll make another line coming up, just like that. And I'm gonna go beyond the little puffs that we made before. And then another little line coming in. Then I'm just gonna go back to the root and add a bit more bones to this tree. A bit more body. A little 
to the side like that. Okay. I'm going to work on the branches later. I just want to add one more tree right next to it. Again, it's going to have the same kind of like, it's going to slope upwards to the right. So the other part of the, the trunk comes out. Again, I just vary the pressure as I bring my brushes up because trunk, because tree branches are always very delicate and thin. So once I got that, I'm gonna move over to my detail brush, get it with the black once again, and we're gonna work on the branches themselves. So again, just think Y shape, the Y shape. Okay. So I kind of, uh, I start usually at like the first branch, and then I kind of taper it out like that to make another branch, okay? That's how I get the most realistic looking branches, is I start like at the trunk area before it splits, and then I bring it out. Because often I see people drawing branches that are like perpendicular from the tree, like it comes out almost 90 degrees. That's very unnatural. Um, you're gonna get very disappointing looking trees if you do that. So it's always good to just start like in the same line of action as the branch itself and then with your brush, just like vary the directions. And that's how you get various real cool looking branches. I'm using a lot of water on my brush to help me A, get a lot more control, more crisp lines, okay? And plus when I let go of the pressure, it really creates a nice, a nice thin line for sure, okay? And then same same thing over here. And then you can always get a little creative. The branches could all like intersect with each other from the previous tree, which is always fun and cool to do. Right. So this kind of reminds me of almost like a calligraphy brush because like your paint becomes almost like an ink. Um, and that's like, that's the kind of the beauty of using like a detail brush that, that's watered down. Gives you a lot more control. Look at that. That's beautiful. And of course, I'm, I always go back to the center of the trunk and try to add any body where it makes sense to add. Okay, that looks awesome. And you know, you can go crazy with this. You can add as many branches or as little branches as you like. It's totally up to you. Hot diggity. Cool. And then, you know, you can always go over here to your previous tree. Now you can always add like a branch or two coming out over the moon light like that. It's up to you though. You don't need to do that if you don't want to. Okay. Okay, awesome. Okay, now that we've gotten our trees in, we're gonna go ahead and add in like little shrubs, but these shrubs obviously don't have any leaves on them. And uh, they kind of look like really spindly and creepy. And of course, it's gonna be the same kind of thought process as our trees, but we're just going to be using the, the branch technique, right? This little tiny branches with our brush. So <clears throat> we're gonna start at the root here of the base of this tree right here. I'm gonna make a, a line kind of bending slightly to the left, just like that. Just like that. And then I'm gonna to start to make 
little tendrils coming out of that main branch. And this is kind of like the whole thing I was talking to about making branches with your detail round brush. Just very slowly, you're just gonna start to add more and more tendrils to your, to your line work. And I'm kind of, uh, so even though the base of the, like the trunk here is kind of veering to the left, I want to make it such that the, the branches are kind of growing and veering to the right. It looks like, it kind of gives a false sense of like this wind that's very powerful that's kind of pushing this, pushing this over this way, which I think looks really cool. Okay. So that's one. And then you can repeat on the other side here. Um, this time maybe I can make I can make the trunk, the shrub here, just standing straight up. Then and I'll just spring out. Just like so. I always release the pressure as it gets to the top, so it creates this really spindly, skinny looking branches. Right. Look how spooky that looks, right? How cool is that? And you know, you can you can just go crazy with this. Like I can add another another base trunk. And then keep on adding my branches as I see fit. Can make it go high, can make them go up like this. I can pretty much do whatever I'd like with this, honestly. I can go crazy if I wanted to. Okay, and then I just connect the two with a bunch of little lines like that. You know what? Let's do maybe let's do another little tiny shrubbery branch out here. Nothing crazy. Okay, that was pretty simple. Again, just take your time with this part. But next, I wanna show you how I make grass. So um, the grass area that's around this hill here, it's pretty much in the same light as the branches um, where I start um, just making very small little lines. Now when it comes to grass, everyone thinks it's like one after the other and they go next to each other. Grass kind of overlaps one another, so it's multiple lines over one another. So I basically start at the base where the, where the grass would be. And then I move it up, releasing pressure as it goes up. Okay. So and I vary the lines of the grass. Some of it's longer, some of it's thinner. But then it kind of tapers off as it gets like towards down like the this portion of the hill. So you can see. I'm, you know, varying my lines, I'm varying the directions of the lines. And also, like, I kind of go out of that, like, general line pattern, just so I can break it up a little bit. That looks really cool, right? <laughs> I just repeat same things. Kind of going between the shrubs here, just to kind of further give that illusion that there's grassage areas. You can make the grass as tall as you'd like, short as you'd like, and there's also going to be some right at this base of the tree here. But you don't have to see, you don't have to see all of that to get the impression that there is blades of grass, right?
awesome. <laughs> that was really cool, actually. Okay. And uh, let's do some by these trees over here. Obviously, the lines will be much smaller. Much, much smaller, but still the same gist. They are, they, the lines kind of go all over the place. Let's do some here. I'm using very, very light strokes. Again, it, this, because I have my brush so watered down, it acts like a calligraphy brush. So it's like almost ink-like paint that's coming out. And so I'm just kind of adding some at the base here. Just making, like, it's almost like feathering it so it doesn't look so contrasty. Oh, that looks so, so cool. <laughs> All right, awesome. And then let's do, let's do a couple of little grass patches like right here. Again, it just shows depth. It just shows that like, you know, there's still grassy knolls in these particular areas. Awesome. Nice. Okay, so at this point here, I wanna start moving on and making our pumpkins. So this is kind of like, we're veering towards the end here. And uh, this this part is fun because this is where you get to really get expressive looking pumpkins, right? So we're gonna have a really good time with this part. You know what, let's put away the detail round brush for a second. We're gonna, we're gonna go to, I'm gonna grab the filbert brush actually. If you don't have a filbert, you can always use your shader brush. Up to you, whatever brush you want to make a nice roundish shape. And we're gonna just add in several pumpkins. Now these pumpkins compared to my other pumpkin tutorial that I put out are just a lot more simple. They're silhouettes. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find that second hill, that second tiny hill we made that's like right around here. And we're gonna add in a pumpkin shape. So I'm just gonna do like a semi, almost like a semi like oval and then another semi-oval next to it. The bottom rounds out, but the top has a little bit of a divot in it. And then it rounds out like that. Okay. And that's all there is to it with making pumpkins. <laughs> you just repeat that. So we're gonna do another one. This one is gonna have a different kind of a shape to it. It has more of a, like a half circle because it looks like it's maybe a little bit more buried in the ground. So there's a half dome pumpkin. Let's do another one that's like half dome like right around here. You can have fun with this part. And then we can do another one that's more circular that's like right around here. And uh, let's do another one that's like right along this grassy knoll. It's gonna be curved this way. So it's like, looks like it's kind of um, hiding almost behind the hill. Okay, cool. And uh, I'm gonna move back to the detail round brush for a second so we can do the smaller pumpkins and uh, also fix up the other pumpkins that we made. So they're cleaner in, in the shape. Okay, so let's do another one that's right here. Something like that. So from here on out, you can add as many pumpkins as you like. You know, you don't have to follow the same numbers that I'm doing. But, you know, you can do fewer pumpkins, you could do no pumpkins, you can do like a bajillion. So it looks like a pumpkin patch. It's really up to you, honestly. And we got a circle here. And then maybe next to this one, let's do another guy. Because I think I think he needs a little friend.
You know what? Let's do one here. Get creative with it, right? Why not? Let's see. Yeah, I think that's good. I'm feeling good about that. Okay. And then of course these pumpkins all have stems. So we can go ahead and add in the stems of our pumpkins. So I literally just make a line. Like I make a line coming out of whatever direction I want the pumpkin stem to look like. And then I just go back in with a second line at the base and thicken it up. And that's really all there is to it. Okay, line of the direction I want it to go. And then another line for the base. Move on, okay. And I like to make curly cues on the pumpkins. I think it's cute. So I'm gonna do that. You know what, I'm gonna do another pumpkin back here, cause why not? I like it when they kind of overlap. It's cool. So we did that. Stem, stem, stem. Another little stem right here. Another little stem right there. Cool. Okay, and then we're gonna go back in, make some more grass because it just looks a little strained without some grass around the pumpkins. So again, using those same light brush strokes, make sure your brush is nice and wet. I just make grass around the pumpkins and I vary the lines. So as it goes away from the pumpkin, it get, the lines get smaller and smaller. Then I also put some in front of the pumpkin itself. So it looks like the grass is obviously covering the majority of the pumpkin. Isn't it cool how this is like coming to life before your eyes? Wait till you add the actual pumpkin faces, then it gets really cool. Okay. And of course, different varying lines, different directions. I have to say, I think details are my favorite parts of any painting. Like backgrounds are fun because you get, you know, it's more broad strokey, but not gonna lie, when it comes to making the details, especially with a detail brush, like, ugh, there's, there is some sort of like cathartic experience to the whole thing, to be honest with you. Comment oh, below, what's your favorite part of a painting when it comes to like the process? Don't tell me the end because everybody loves the end um, because it's over and you know, you're kind of feeling like creatively exhausted. But like, what part is your favorite? Is it painting the background? Is it doing the details? Comment below, let me know. Okay. Like seriously, how cool does this look right now? And what's nice is the more details you add, just like the more this painting seems to come to life, right? I'm adding more and more like grass details. And I feel like, I feel like it's really, bringing this whole painting, like, it's making it come alive.
And I even do like random patches of grass here and there. Don't have to like wait for an actual pumpkin to show up to do it. I think I'm gonna do some right around here. Because why not? Yeah, this part can take you as long as you'd like it to take you. <laughs> you know, I think when I was first working on this, it took me like just a good half an hour just to put in all the grass details. So just, you know, get some music out. Have some fun with this part. It really is therapeutic. What I usually find is helpful too, is I try to concentrate some of the, the grass at the bases of the pumpkin. So it looks like the grass is legitimately covering it up. Not just that we place the pumpkins first. So I tend to add more of like a feathery look to the bottoms of the pumpkins, more black to it. And see how it kind of looks like it's been there the entire time. It's been kind of sitting on the grass there. It's because I'm just like concentrating a lot of the black in that area. Vary the lines too. So it helps cut the, it makes that illusion, cuts like the straight lines of the bottoms of the pumpkin. Awesome. Now, now that we still have working with the black, I want to go back to the moon for, for a second. I want to add some bats. <laughs> now the bats are silhouettes, of course, so they're going to be very, very simplistic, but all you need to do when it comes to a bat is you do a line like this. So you make like a V that has like two lines coming out on both sides, and then you can do a center line like that. So then you just rinse and repeat. So we got a straight line, V, straight line, like that. V, straight line, V, straight line. So you can do lots of bats or just very small amount of bats, up to you. I'm just gonna do a couple. Loving it. Okay, we're almost done. <laughs> okay, so lastly, we're going to add in our details. So we're going to be putting in the faces of the pumpkins as well as the outlines of the trees. So, and the stars as well. So um, all we're gonna do is we're gonna grab some of that yellow and then add white, lots and lots of white, okay? Because we want to, again, create that like moon glow. 
Okay, and again, wipe off any of the excess paint. Okay, once you got that ready, let's go ahead and uh, make our outline. So let's go to the, to the branches of the trees here first. Now I'm only just thinking about the areas of the tree that are going, that are kind of silhouetted against the black of the night. And I'm just very lightly adding in a line along the branches. Um, and it's very thin. It's just to help differentiate the branches and shows kind of a form against the night sky. I don't have a lot of paint on my brush when I'm doing this, so I'm kind of working very slowly to show off those branches. Same thing on these branches here. And I'm working kind of quickly because I don't want to concentrate too much on this part, honestly. You know, we, we can kind of sometimes get in trouble when we just concentrate too much on something. So I'm just gonna just add in little smooth details. Nothing, nothing crazier than that. And of course, you can always go back in later and add more if you'd like. You can even like make more branches if you want to, but I'm gonna leave it at that. Okay, and now let's get to the pumpkins. We're gonna make our pumpkins uh, make have faces. So let's um, let's start with this pumpkin over here. This pumpkin's gonna have more like a a triangular side looking face. So we're gonna start with a, almost like a triangle, but instead of filling it all in, it's gonna have a little hump, just like so. Again, triangle, a little hump in the middle. Fill that in so it looks like it's grinning. And then give it a wide smile like that from ear to ear. Just kind of fill that in a little bit. And that's it. <laughs> so we'll just uh, continue onward. So we got this pumpkin here. We're gonna give him a circle, but don't do a full circle because there's gonna be another circle within that circle, kind of like that. And then there's a circle, a circle within that circle. Now, because these pumpkins are done in black, if you mess up. Just go in with the black, you can fix it, no problem. So we fill those in, and then he's gonna have like a nice toothy grin. So just do like a line going along like so. You give him like a little tooth and just fill it in. Easy. <laughs> Isn't it crazy how like how they just they pop they come they come to life here, which I love. Okay, let's do this guy. So he's gonna have the same kind of eyes as our first pumpkin dude. So he's got the triangles with the little circle in the center, and he's got the wide grin. Love it. <laughs> okay. Let's keep on going. So now this pumpkin here is gonna be more menacing, so I'm gonna make his eyes going downwards like that. Like that. Oh yeah. And then I'm gonna give him a toothy grin. Just like that. Nothing crazy. Let's do another one. And this time just pure triangle eyes. Toothy grin. So you can you can go as creative as you want with all their faces. Like this one here is gonna have a, a sad face. So I literally just do those lines. But you can vary this as much as you'd like. Now this pumpkin here is kind of looking this way. So we'll do those the half circle with the circle on the inside. Half circle, circle on the inside. Paint that in. And then I'm gonna give him a nose. And then I'm gonna give, like a, I'm gonna do a circle for the O. So he's like, oh, what's happening here? 
And then this pumpkin here is kind of the bad boy. So we're gonna do slanted eyes, kind of menacingly looking in. So we have two eyes looking down like so. And then they kind of match with a little inner circle on the inside. Match with a little circle on the inside like that. Again, you can always go back in with black to fix. He's got a triangular nose. Then he's got a wide grin. And uh, I think I'm gonna put his teeth in just in a second, but I'm gonna fill this whole part in. But this looks really cool. <laughs> How neat is that, right? <laughs> so we're gonna let him dry for a second, but I'm gonna go to the house now. And I'm just going to, with that same color, just do the parts of the house that are kind of reflecting against the moonlight itself. Just kind of like that. So it like it just has that it just has that feature. It looks like it's popping out, which looks awesome. Loving it, loving it, loving it. Okay. So while we're waiting for our little pumpkins to dry, we're just gonna add in some stars. So I'm just gonna clean my detail round brush, dip it in some white, and then with some dots, and add in some of your star light. Just like that. Now you don't have to add this part if you don't want to, but I personally, I personally like it. It adds some pizzazz. Now I'm kind of concentrating them more on the top here with little starlight coming down. Okay. Maybe a couple down here, but not too much. Oh, I love that. That is such cool contrast. And of course, if you want to make more like twinkle lights, you can do that. So we can add the, uh, those bigger stars. If you want to give it that more like magical quality, more bewitching looking sky, if you will. That part is totally up to you. And then of course, if you need to fix up your pumpkins, you can always go back in with your detail round brush and some black. And you can go ahead and add in any extraneous details that you wanna fix up. Like, you wanna add fangs to this pumpkin here. Fix up his toothy grin. Fix up the face, the mouth a little bit. It's really incredible what layering can do here, right? It gives you that nice extra looking clean, clean look. And like I said, you can decorate as many of these pumpkins as you want if you want to add, because I know there's a few that we've left untouched, but that's up to you. If you want to add faces to them, go for it. Okay, and then you can you can either call it done right now, or you just keep on going, adding in your grass, whatever you see fit. So I'm gonna add some grass right around here.
That really is all there is to it. In fact, I really do like adding the grass area. I'm extending that a little more over here as well. All right, queen bees, and that's how you go about making your very own haunted house Halloween painting. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. And there we have it, my queen bees. I hope you enjoyed that tutorial. If you did, please be sure to give this video a like and to subscribe to my channel. Hit that like button. You know what to do so that you can see more tutorials and other videos of the art-related variety from me to you in the future. And if you want to check out all my other Halloween-related paintings, be sure to check out this playlist right over here. I hope you all are enjoying the Halloween season. I know I certainly am. Am, especially with all of the accoutrement and the paintings and just getting into the headspace of being spooky. So remember to just love yourselves and always have fun with your art. I'll see you all next time. Bye!